For those of you who don't know, the Benzonia Academy was established in 1863 by our community of uh, founders. And it was really founded as an educational colony. And it was open to all people, regardless of race or sex. So it was a pretty liberal educational facility at that time. And we seek to carry on the tradition of our founders by offering this lecture on the second Thursday of each month. During the winter months, we have it at four o'clock. And during the summer months, starting in May, it'll be at 7 p.m. We do record them for later viewing on our website. And um, that's it on the lecture. So I encourage you to check out some of our past lectures. So the Benzie Area Historical Society is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we rely on donations from people like you to maintain our museum home, and that was built in 1886, and the Drake School as well, and to support all, all of our educational programming. So we hope you'll consider supporting the lecture series uh, with a donation and uh, a donation to our annual appeal as well. And a gentle reminder to turn off your microphones during the presentation. And I did let you know that we are recording the presentation um, for later viewing. And now I'd like to introduce Brian McCall. Uh, Brian, I've been very blessed to work with him. Um, he joined the Historical Society board. In fact, he was on the board when I joined here um, four years ago. And uh, for the last year and a half, um, he served on the board. He was our board president. So I worked very closely with him. He's one of our favorite lecturers, and um, we're glad to have Brian here. So I'll give you a little bit of back background on Brian. He earned a bachelor's degree in secondary education and MA master's degrees in American history from Central Michigan University and in Scottish and modern British history from the University of, I'll probably murder this word, but Strathclyde in Glasgow, Scotland. Um, he has been a member of the Interlochen Arts Academy of Liberal Arts faculty since 1998, where he teaches history and political science. Paul has also served as an adjunct history, uh, American history professor at Northwestern Michigan College and at many other universities and colleges across the country, actually overseas as well. Uh, Brian serves as vice president of the Traverse City Historical Society is a past member of the Michigan Legacy Art Park and the Northwestern Michigan College International Affairs Forum. He's also a past member of the Grand Traverse Heritage Center Advisory Council. So you can tell that history is in his blood and I'm glad to introduce Brian McCall. Thank you very much, Barb. And it's such a pleasure to be back here with my friends from Bensi. And, uh, and let me say uh, to all of you on this call, um, we, uh, when I was president, it was a great honor to be a part of this organization and to see so many people on a Zoom call in, in December is really gratifying. And the, uh, this institution is worth saving. Our, uh, our history and buildings like the museum are precious. And if they're gone, they're really hard to replace. Um, so those of you who are friends of the museum, thank you for your support. And we can't keep this place open without you. So thank you very much. Uh, normally when I would give a, an academy lecture, I think I've done about three of these now. Uh, this may be my fourth one. I've done them live and I would always start out uh, by asking the audience why they're there. Why would you leave your warm homes, drive through the snow, come to the museum and sit in a hot room because the air conditioning or the heating can be a little iffy in that meeting space. And why would you come to listen about something that happened so long ago, or in some cases, not that long ago, but far enough in the past that it's a memory now more than our recent history. And uh, I'm always interested in the responses I get. Some people can't really vocalize why they're interested in the past. Is it because they think they need to be? Is it their own personal memories? I have a feeling this particular lecture may cut kind of close to home for some people. Um, this Christmas of 1944, the December of 1944, was a really poignant one and um, difficult one, but with all this potential for a better world just over the horizon. So this one, I think, has a lot of deep meaning for people who were alive during World War II. And um, that included my parents. Um, my parents both passed away this year. 
Uh, they were both born in 1937. And I'll talk about them at the end of my lecture um, as a source for why I'm interested in World War II. They were young, they were children through it. Uh, so they saw this through children's eyes. And that will be one of the things that I'll focus on is how kids in the 1940s saw the experience of World War II. How the adults saw it, obviously, is also very important. And some of you might be on this call who were adults during World War II. Our numbers uh, of World War II veterans shrinks every day. And we're <laughs> down to, I believe, we're less than of the 16 million that served in World War II in uniform, uh, men and women. I think there's less than a million of them left. And um, with them goes the memory of this period. So I hope this lecture will have some meaning and some resonance for those of you who do have memories of this period and want to remember why it matters. Um, can everyone hear me? I, I just saw there was a, a note in the chat here. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, because we're not having a... We're not having a question and answer session. I'll start right kind of on a cold start. And I believe, Barb, at the end, uh, can we do some Q&A at the back end? Yes, if people, uh, if you post your questions in the chat, then I will uh, save them for Brian till the end. Or if you wanna share a memory or a comment, um, we could do that at the end too. So here we go. Uh, Americans in late 1944 probably knew more about the world than in any other time in our history. Ordinary people who had never traveled out of their counties or small towns suddenly had color world maps printed in the newspapers, National Geographic, or other magazine, magazines pinned to their kitchen walls or tucked away with a collection of V-mail letters from the training camps, the thousands of ships, or the front lines from around the globe. They had a rough idea what fronts were moving and which were static. If their loved ones or neighbors were in a safe place or on the firing line. Within the United States, wives and families were on the move along with the troops, heading to factories and shipyards or sometimes training camps where the weapons of war poured out of by the thousands every day. Housing, gas, tires, train tickets, meat, sugar, clothing, shoes, and a million other consumer goods were either in short supply, rationed, or non-existent. Take gas, for example. Car owners were issued a gasoline ration card. And if you had, uh, you would get a little one, one unit tab on the bottom, and they were punched every time you want to, to get gas. Uh, along with a card, you got a window sticker with a specific letter. If you had an A sticker, you were allowed to buy four gallons of gas a week. That's it. Then that was reduced to three. People quit driving. If you worked in a factory that supported the war effort, like my grandparents did, you were issued a B card. And doctors, nurses, and farm and construction workers, postal employees were given a C card. That allowed you to buy up to eight gallons of gas a week. Just before the war, if you're interested in cars, one particular brand of car really focused on economy and gas mileage. It was called the Nash. And the Nashes were claimed if you drove them downhill and with a tailwind that you could get 25 miles to the gallon. Uh, those of you who drive on a regular basis can just imagine how little you could go on three gallons of gas. <laughs> Uh, no new cars after January of 1942, and very soon, no, very few used cars were available for sale. Right now, we've been hearing about a, a, a problem with used cars in the market, but nothing like what happened in 1942. And, and by 19, uh, 1944, and by 1944, most drivers were rolling on tires they bought in 1941, if they were lucky. Tires were gone. Beer, wine, and liquor, on the other hand, flowed. And the government found out during Prohibition that trying to stop drinking, even in Benzie County, uh, was a fool's errand, and that American farmers produced plenty of grain to brew or distill, even during wartime. But rum and brandy, uh, anything coming from grapes or sugar, 
uh, surpassed whiskey during the duration of the war. So a lot of people like to learn to drink rum and Coke during World War II. Um, there was plenty of booze to ring in the holidays, at least here in the States. For many American working families, cash was not a problem. Uh, weapon production at a full wartime economy meant by 19, late 1944, unemployment had practically disappeared in big parts of the country. A huge change from the dark days of the Depression. Uh, moms and wives took off their aprons and put on coveralls and welding masks. Most of the employees of the booming U.S. aviation industry were women. And apartments and working housing was almost impossible to find. Always a sign that the economy is on the move. Um, apartment uh, homeowners rented out almost every spare bedroom in America. Uh, as their boys left to go in the service, uh, they would advertise the bedrooms in the paper and fill them. Uh, so families became mixed with strangers living in people's houses. Uh, some factory workers decided to give up looking for housing and they just slept at the factory. They brought cots and slept on the floor. Uh, it didn't make any sense to go commuting. They could eat in the canteen and they just, they'd spend weeks building tanks, trucks, planes, whatever, the, whatever was needed. Uh, it was very common to pull uh, double shifts where you're working 16 hours on the line, putting tanks together. Um, to stop, an interesting fact about this period, to stop the big companies like General Motors and Ford from taking every worker and leaving small businesses without anyone, the government slapped on wage and price controls for the first time ever. And that meant that they couldn't outprice people who were working in bakeries or taxi drivers or whatnot to end up in all the war industries. But the big companies had one benefit that the government allowed them to give to their factory workers that small business couldn't compete with. And that was subsidized health insurance. And our private health insurance issues that we have today come out of World War II. Uh, that was a benefit because healthcare didn't cost as much back then that General Motors could say, come work for us and we'll pay you insane amounts of money. But more importantly, you'll have free doctor visits afterwards. But for the shortage of everything compared to peacetime, uh, there were shortages of almost everything except cash uh, during peacetime. And less Americans knew what it was like to live in a real war zone. And thanks to the letters from home, many of them on the front line knew how lucky they were. Nearly 12 million American men and women were in uniform by 19, December 1944, soon to reach 16 million by the end of the war. And they were drawn from a nation of 140 million people. I'm not a math major, but that simply means that just about everyone in America had a brother, a son, a father, a mother, an uncle, a cousin, a nephew, a neighbor in uniform, somewhere around the world. Um, everyone was in the service, it seemed like, and every family was affected by this. Uh, and in December of 1944, those sailors, soldiers, airmen, Marines, merchant Marines, and Coasties, they made sure to get them all, were literally around the world, on every continent and every ocean, working with our allies, the British, the Russians, even then, and every other nation committed to feeding Nazism and Japanese aggression, American men and women saw firsthand the cost and carnage of modern industrial war and the brutality of the Axis forces still fighting for world domination. Everywhere, the Nazis and the Japanese were in retreat or stopped. But even though it was clear they could not win, they refused to admit defeat. And in December of 1944, it was a real time of hope and heartbreak. Final victory was clearly in sight, but much hard fighting, terror, pain, killing, and dying lay ahead. Who would survive to enjoy the fruits of peace? So I have a sample of the active fronts in 1944 as the war built to a bloody climax. And the first one I thought I would start with is Italy. And I did that before I wrote this lecture a week ago, but some of you know who we lost uh, as one of our greatest American statesmen uh, this last week in Senator Bob Dole, who died at age 98. He's one of our veterans from the Italian campaign. It's often called the Forgotten Front. 
and it was the scene of very brutal combat north of Florence, Italy, one of my favorite places in the world, across the spine of the peninsula as the dirt Germans had dug into strong positions in the Italian mountains, known as the Gothic Line, and they had fought a protracted war of attrition with understrength allied units. Most of the naval support and amphibious equipment that had been used by the allies in the Mediterranean in 1942 and 1943 had been removed from the Italian front to supply the needs of the allied armies in France since D-Day in June. American air, allied and American air power was also reduced in 1944. Again, that was to support the larger forces in the North. But this meant that American troops had to fight very tough fortifications manned by small but highly determined and well-trained German soldiers. Cold, rain, snow, and mud characterized the weather of the Italian campaign. Uh, Senator Bob Dole, who just passed away on Monday at age 98, was on his way to Italy in December of 1944 as part of the 10th Mountain Division, where he would be severely wounded in April of 1945. For most Americans at home, news of the Italian front had faded away from the papers once the Allies took Rome on June 5th, 1944, one day before the biggest event of the Second World War. On a side note, Alexa. when Alexa. I worked here my first year at Interlochen, I met a woman named Pearl Roth. She was a really wonderful lady. And uh, my wife introduced me to her and she said, you should get to know Pearl. I said, okay, I, I like your, people, your friends. And um, so I got to talk to her one day and I said, so my wife says I should meet you. And she goes, I don't know why, what, 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 did, what did she think I want to talk about? I said, were you in World War II? Oh yes, that, I was the general's driver. She drove General Mark Clark around Italy <laughs> during World War II. He was the top American commander of the Italian campaign. And we had a lot of talks about what it was like to be a woman in uniform driving around with a general and being shot at and shelled at and landmines and everything that went with it. She was an amazing woman. South of Italy, in North Africa, after the Nazis were forced out of Tunisia and Libya in mid-1943, thousands of U.S. Army, Navy, and Allied personnel stayed behind and used North African ports and free French military bases as forward operating centers. The US Army Air Corps used many North Af African airfields to stage bombing raids into uh, Nazi-held Nazi territory and to launch fighter sweeps to attack Axis, naval units, and other U-boats in the Mediterranean Sea. These soldiers and airmen fought a never-ending war with desert conditions and sandstorms, even in December. Meanwhile, out on the North Atlantic, the war that started in 1939 began at sea for the Royal Navy, and the United States Navy picked up helping the Royal Navy on December 7th, 1941, and had stayed out there ever since. And the North Atlantic was really one of the, again, forgotten parts of World War II. Um, the U.S. Navy had worked with the Royal Canadian Navy and then the Royal British Royal Navy to clear the seas of U-boats. If you go on Wikipedia and you do a day-to-day -day summary of World War II and you look at the month of December, every day in December, almost practically every day, the U.S. Navy or the Royal Navy has sunk another German U-boat. They were killing those crews and sinking those boats almost every day, sometimes two or three a day. Um, by December of 1944, the war at sea, at least between the allied fleets of supplies and ships and the German U-boats coming to attack them was almost at an end. Um, U-boat crews started to see their patrols as suicide miss missions, but they were still sinking allied ships and killing American soldiers and sailors and civilians. Some of you might know the secret war that revolved around the U-boat war. The British at their secret base at Bletchley Park developed the very first electronic computers. These computers were used along with some incredibly brilliant mathematicians to break the German code that was being used to signal the U-boats. By 1943, the allies were able to read almost in real time what the German U-boats were being signaled. They could pinpoint where they were. That's why they were able to go and get them and kill them. The trouble of course was if you killed too many of the U-boats and showed up exactly where they were, 
the Germans were not stupid. They would figure out that the code was broken and they'd change it or do something else to signal the ships. By some miracle, the Germans never figured this out. And at the end of the war, this was kept a secret until the 1980s. A uh, very fascinating movie has been made about this called The Imitation Game, about breaking the code that let the Allies read where the U-boats were. One of the ships, though, that the U-boats did get was the Belgian troop ship, the SS Leopoldville. It was sunk on Christmas Eve by a U-boat in the English Channel within sight of the French port of Cherbourg, where American soldiers were occupied. Approximately 763 American soldiers and 56 of the crew were killed. Most of the Americans jumped into the waters. Can you imagine how cold they were on, New Year, on Christmas Eve in December of 1944 with their full packs, 80 pounds of equipment in their rifles. They sank like stones and froze to death. The survivors, once they picked them up, were brought into France and then locked into camps and told to never talk about this. News of the Leopoldville was absolutely and ruthless, ruthlessly suppressed. Uh, the U.S. government did not want the news that the U.S. shore parties, Christmas parties on the French coast are the reason that those men died. No one was listening to the radios or picking up the phone when the uh, Leopoldville radioed in for help that it had been torpedoed. Those men never needed to die. Uh, those men that came back alive were then told if they ever talked about it, they'd be court-martialed and sent to prison. Uh, and it never came out until the late 1980s. Earlier in December, on December 15th, a small plane took off from England to fly to, uh, to France. On that plane was uh, someone that some of you on this call will know. His name was Glenn Miller. That plane disappeared over the English Channel and it's never been found since. There's some theories about what happened to Glenn Miller, and one of the most saddest ones is that he may have been the victim of American bombers coming back from a mission where they could not drop their bombs because the weather was so bad. And standard practice in World War II on bombing raids is if you can't drop your bombs on the target, you fly over open water and find a space where you can, because you cannot land a plane with armed bombs on it. The theory is that Glenn Miller's plane was flying underneath a formation of American bombers that did just that. They were flying back. They had not been able to drop their bombs. They opened up their bomb bay doors. They let them fly into the English Channel, and one of those bombs must have hit his plane. That's uh, probably what happened, but we don't know. Um, the Channel and the North Atlantic were the scenes of some of the saddest stories of World War II because very few people heard about what happened out there. In Western Europe itself, after D-Day on June 6th, the American and Allied forces finally began to fight the Nazi war machine in France. They battled tough resistance for weeks of stalemate in Normandy and heavy losses until the weight of the Allied attack finally broke the German army's hold on the Western Front in late summer of 1944. What followed was a fast moving series of Allied victories and Nazi retreats retreats across from almost all of France, most of Belgium, and parts of Holland. But, by, but on December 16th, the German army, which had retreated all this time, launched a huge counterattack in the dense Ardennes forest, which is a part of Belgium, that smashed into a weak section of the Allied line and threw back the stunned American soldiers in what would be called the Battle of the Bulge. It took weeks of hard fighting and death to put the, push the Germans back to their original positions and then finally into Germany. Nearly 20,000 U.S. soldiers died between December 1944 and January 1945 in the Bulge. It's the largest American casualty list of World War II. While the fighting in Belgium raged in the snow and cold, other U.S. troops kept pushing hard to invade Germany itself or take back the last sections of Holland. Meanwhile, in the skies above Western Europe, every day, thousands of US Army Air Corps pilots and air crews fought life and death battles with the last of the vaunted Luftwaffe, and some cases equipped with jet planes, the Germans were. Uh, clouds of flak and rockets and German fighters shot down hundreds of allied planes, but American factories, 
and the U.S. Army Air Corps training bases replaced those losses with new planes and new crews almost overnight. Many of those lost on raids over Nazi-occupied territory survived, but ended up in cold German POW camps, waiting to be liberated and hoping to survive the final battles. Many thousands of Americans were also stationed in Great Britain on hundreds of airfields, in army camps, on Navy bases, or living in British homes with English families. A bit of a role reversal from the days of the American Revolution and the Quartering Act. But our hosts were gracious and generous. And while American troops were well paid and supplied compared with the average British family, they'd been living with five years of war, war rationings and threats of bombing, either from planes or from rockets. It was often the same in newly liberated France, Italy, Belgium, and Holland. In these homes, Americans got to see firsthand the cost of war. Then we get to the Pacific Theater. And I want to go back in time a little bit. During World War I, 25 years earlier, the United States Navy and the U.S. Army had a huge task. They had to build a wartime fleet and a massive army that could be organized, trained, equipped, and transported the Atlantic to the Western Front in France in one year from April of 1917 to the spring of 1918 in order to have time to stop and then defeat the powerful German Imperial Ar Army of Kaiser Wilhelm. And they accomplished this mission. And those young officers in World War I who led the, who helped do this for the Allies in November of 1918 were now in 1944, the leaders of the American military that had a mission several times the size and complexity of their older mentors. The scale of the war in the Pacific staggers the imagination. Thousands of miles of trackless ocean, tiny desert islands, dense jungles, frozen volcanic landscapes, and from Australia to Alaska, with a battered China taking the biggest blows from the relentless Japanese war machine since 1937. Our allies, the British, the Indian Army, the Australians, the New Zealanders, and thousands of partisan forces in the Japanese occupied territory all relied on US supplies and US troops to stay in the fight. Japan had struck hard and fast in December, 1941, 80 years ago this week. And for six months, they'd had almost complete success. But by the summer and the fall of 1942, the tide had turned with American victories at Midway and at the bloody battles of Guadalcanal. But as a wise veteran once told me, when it comes to war, amateurs talk tactics, professionals talk logistics. And when it came to that, the United States was slowly but surely winning the logistics battle. The U.S. Merchant Marine and the U.S. Navy covered all of the oceans, carrying war supplies and at great distances across the Pacific, building mountains of supplies of guns, ammunition, planes, tanks, trucks, fuel, food, medicine, and everything in between. And other freighters ranged the greatest fleet that has ever taken to the seas with warships of every size and type, including seven of the modernized refloated battleships that had been sunk at Pearl Harbor. Uh, two were not saved, the USS Oklahoma, and of course, most of you know, the USS Arizona. The rest of the fleet was almost all brand new. Gigantic aircraft carriers, fast battleships, cruisers, swarms of destroyers, and hundreds of escort vessels, plus a huge fleet of support ships from every size that covered the sea from horizon to horizon. When the U.S. Navy showed up, they, made, they showed up with a bang. Far ahead of them and underneath the waves, U.S. submarines lurked in packs, or solo, waiting to strike the Japanese. And by 1944, the US Navy had dominated the waves like no other fleet in history. Trained state stateside, packed in troop ships, and deployed in landing crafts, the all-volunteer Marine Corps only fought its bloody World War II battles in the Pacific. They took all those hardened fort 
island fortresses one at a time from the Japanese, hopping over some of the stronger ones to surprise uh, ones that weren't suspected. Enormous fleets of Navy carrier aircraft, U.S. Army Air Corps, and U.S. Marine planes, fighters and bombers filled the skies by 1940, uh, December of 44, sweeping the Japanese away, but not without great loss. By, 19, by December of 1944, kamikazes were regularly raining down on U.S. warships in suicide dives, killing thousands of American sailors and airmen. And in the Philippines, the U.S. Army was fighting its bloodiest battles of the Pacific, taking back the islands it had lost in 1942. The terrible Battle of Manila waited for next year. Further west, across the Sea of Japan, thousands of U.S. servicemen were stationed in western China, India, Burma, Australia, everywhere in the Pacific that we were fighting the Japanese, you would find Americans. They were either fighting them hand to hand on the front lines or supplying other allied forces in the Pacific. The Burma front is particularly is sort of like the Italian front for the Europeans. Burma was forgotten by many Americans, but thousands of Americans served there. Following in the wave awake of the US Marines, sailors, soldiers across the Pacific and European theaters were thousands of American service women in a wide range of roles besides of course nurses, and support staff. Americans of all races, colors, and faiths fought in World War II, many experiencing blatant racism and prejudice at home and on duty while fighting fascism overseas. Over 130,000 Japanese Americans were locked in dusty prison camps, that's what you'd have to call them, while many of their military-aged sons signed up to defend the nation that did not trust the loyalty of their families. African-American soldiers and sailors faced massive discrimination and insults at almost every level during the war, while the Marines refused to even let them enlist. Black veterans of the war formed the leadership of the civil rights movement to come, and Native Americans signed up for duty in the largest percentage of any group in America and took the casualties that resulted from such service to the country that stole their land and suppressed their culture. The Second World War was the largest event in human history. As this catalog of American fronts and forces show, it was a global conflict. And I have not mentioned the other enormous theater of war, the Eastern Front, or the first two years of Nazi invasions across Europe. Taken by itself, the German-Soviet War of 1941 and 1945 is the largest war in the world's history on a scale of death and destruction that dwarfs all the other fronts combined. By December of 1944, few on the Allied side had heard of what we now know as the Holocaust and the final solution. But knowledge of Nazis' atrocities was widespread, but incomplete. Out in the Nevada desert near Los Alamos, the combined work of 200,000 engineers, scientists and factory workers across the nation was nearly done as the first atomic bombs were constructed. Soon the first would be ready to be tested and then deployed. Hitler still ruled a battered and bombed Germany with an iron fist and Japan had yet to feel the power of massive B-29 bombers raining fire and death on its wooden cities and its civilians. The final bloody battles across Germany and the last invasions of Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and the skies over Tokyo or in the streets of Berlin lay ahead. More people would die in the last months of World War II than in any other period of the war. The end was in sight, final victory, and then peace. But before the guns fell silent, the telegraphs kept coming. Home front families, after a long day at the office or working at a home at a wartime pace would be sitting down to dinner using their rationed food the best that they could when the doorbell rang western union sent its army of teenage messengers in the early evening bearing updates from the front birthday greetings wedding announcements 
official orders to return to duty were the worst news imaginable. The first sentence was always roughly the same. The Secretary of War regrets to inform you that your husband, your father, your son was killed in action or missing in action. For those who answered the door and saw the Western Union boy waiting on the step, the memory of that pain has never left them. Others were told that their loved ones were missing in action or a prisoner of war. In December of 1944, these messages of grief were delivered to homes decorated for Christmas with festive trees in the window and Bing Crosby singing on the radio. And every evening, the Western Union Army would deploy night after night. Back in snowy Belgium, at the center of the bulge, created by the massive attack of the Germans in the Ardennes, a small pocket of American soldiers in the para and paratroopers from the 101st Airborne Division and assorted US troops were preparing to hold their positions in the blasted town of Bastogne, an important road junction and right in the middle of a sea of Nazi tanks and troops. The US forces there had retreated, but then stood their ground. And despite repeated German tank attacks and relentless shell fire. Since December 16th and the first hour of the Nazi uh, off offensive, the men of Bastogne had held out, completely surrounded and cut off. On the 22nd, a Nazi offer to surrender was met with a simple reply, and I quote, nuts, which apparently did not translate well into German. The skies above Belgium were filled with clouds and snow, which grounded almost all the U.S. and British air, air power. The cold was the worst for the men in the icy foxholes in the trenches. The guns froze, and then so did their feet. Food, ammunition, and medicine were running out. Then, on Christmas Eve, after a round of prayers for better weather, the skies finally cleared, and waves of American cargo planes appeared and dropped hundreds of tons of supplies to the embattled garrison. Christmas had come early. The defenders of Bastogne now had enough ammunition to hold out until stronger armored forces could battle their way to them in the snow and the cold. But the clear skies meant that the Germans could fly as well. And that night, using the fires of the ruined town as a target, they pounded the encircled Americans and the trapped civilian population. Hundreds died under the bombs and the shells, including dozens of nurses and wounded when a field hospital was hit. But Patton's Third Army's tanks were close by, and the first Sherman tanks broke through that, that German line on December 26th, 1944. This story's always had a lot of poignancy for me because my grandfather worked in this tank factory that made some of those Sherman tanks. This effectively ended the, sh the siege. And by the 22nd, 20, the 26th, the Germans began to retreat slowly back to Germany, where they would continue to resist and finally surrender to allied forces in early May. Back in America, though, every evening, the Army of Western Union messengers went out on their missions of delivering the worst news imaginable. I was born 21 years after December, 1944. So all I know of this period is what I've read and heard my late parents discussed about the war and what it meant to them. During World War II, my, my family was spared a telegram. Both my grandfathers were older than military age and they worked night and day in flint factories, welding tanks and building machine guns. Well, my grandmothers sewed bandages, they collected fat, they scrapped metal drives and, my, and saving their ration cards provided for their families and then prayed for their brothers and friends fighting far from home. Two of my great uncles jumped on D-Day, one in the 82nd Airborne, one in the 101st and they both came home to tell the tale. They passed away before I was born, so I never got to meet them. My mother knew that every gold star on a front door meant that someone had paid the ultimate price for freedom, and they made sure to treat those families with respect and dignity. Born in 1937 and growing up poor in the worst of the depression, neither of my parents expected much 
from Christmas in 1944, but they heard that victory was near and peace was coming someday. They had only known FDR as their president, and they knew his voice on the radio meant that there was serious news to share. Wherever they went, to school, to shops, to church, the war followed them. My dad told me that his parents kept most of the war news from him, but his friends and teachers filled him in, and he could see the newsreels when he snuck into the local movie house. As Christmas 1944 approached, my future parents could both sense that the adults in their world were acting differently, daring to hope that the end was near. Would 1945 really bring peace on earth? We've rarely been more united in a common cause than in December of 1944. It's sad that a war would bring that unity. Thank you very much for your attention today, and I hope this has been a good lecture for you. Thanks. Does anybody have any questions for Brian? I've got a question. And I don't know if you know much about this because it's actually post-war, but we often hear about how the GI Bill lifted a lot of people up into the middle class, but there's not a lot of talk about that. It was only, you know, only certain Americans were eligible for that. Did the, you know, you know, the Indian or the Black American um, veterans, did they get anything from the, the GI Bill? It was far more difficult for them to qualify for benefits. Uh, think of uh, the Native Americans. When the war is over, where will they live? They will return back to their reservations in most cases. Uh, for African Americans, it was back to the ghetto or sharecropping share, share shacks and Jim Crow America, or redlined uh, housing districts, where if you walked into a bank with black skin with a loan application in your hand, one of the security officers would show you the door. So uh, to actually use the benefits that legally were they were entitled to was in many cases impossible. There's one exception to that, and that is for African-Americans who wanted to go to college because in the aftermath of the reconstruction period in the South, what we now call historically black colleges started to spring up. They qualified for federal money. Some of these were very poor and underfunded institutions, but they existed. And numbers of African-Americans who wanted to go to college and could go to college increased. We don't see the same kind of numbers for Native Americans though. That's a great question though. I haven't looked at the chat. So would you like to read those questions off to me? I can open it up if you need me to, though. I lost you for a minute there. I was going to say, if you, would you like to read the chat questions? And I'll answer them one at a time. I don't. Let me see. Um, do you have any, Nancy Turner wants to know if you have book recommendations for a good overview of World War II. This was a great lecture. I want to know more. Uh, the two historians that have been my go-to are actually two um, if you want an overview with one volume, uh, my two favorite ones are two Englishmen. Uh, one passed away 10 years ago. His name is John Keegan and his second world war history. He actually is probably more famous for writing about world war one, but he has an excellent second world war history. Uh, again, it's going to be from a British perspective and it'll be uh, in a one volume treaty. The other historian who's really amazing um, is a name is an Englishman named Anthony Beevor. And Anthony Beevor specializes in taking particular aspects of World War II and bringing them to life. I've been reading about this stuff since I was five years old. I pick up an Anthony Beevor book and I will have to drop it sometimes. I'm so shocked at some of the things I've never heard of that he has found out. He's that good of a historian. He also, and this should help you understand how exciting he is as a writer, he is banned from Russia. In fact, if he tries to go to Russia, he'll be arrested. Because one of his books details extensively what the Russians are going to do in Berlin after and during 
their attack on the very last days of World War II, the widespread sexual assault of every woman they could get their hands on in Berlin. And he exposed, we've all known about it in history, but nobody has written about it as extensively and documented as well as Anthony Bivor has. That got him on Putin's hit list and uh, he's not welcome there. He also has a one volume history of World War II. So those two, if you go onto Amazon or your local bookstore, go to look for local bookstore first, uh, Keegan or Bivor. As far as American historians, um, it's hard to beat the, uh, um, I'm going to lose, oh, Rick Atkinson. And he writes very big books that are done in chronological fashion. And he mostly focuses on the American side of the war. His, uh, he's got a three volume trilogy about the US Army in Europe. And if you start reading him, you won't put him down, but it's going to be, you'll, you'll have to get all three. Uh, the other historian that's covering the Pacific War is. Um, and Brian, um, could you share? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, if you'd like me to, I could put some of these. If we keep the a Zoom call open, I can look for the uh, names and put them in the chat. Okay. And then if people miss it, then maybe I can, we can, I'm thinking what we could do is include it on the website, on yeah. our news and posts, right? With the lecture announcement. You know what we can do, Barb? I'll put together too. a quick reading list and you so can we'll post get it out on to the people. website. The last author I'd like to mention. I have another question. Yeah. How? Yeah, we'll get it on the website. And yep. um, if somebody doesn't have access to our website for some reason, you can always call the museum and then I'll pull them up for you. Um, somebody wants to know how long did rationing continue? Did, it, did that continue after the war at all? Rationing does but it's then replaced with inflation. <laughs> uh, so um, the United States uh, economy uh, crashed after World War I. Uh, when World War I ended in 1918, abruptly uh, with the armistice, um, the government had really had not had time to think about what's gonna happen when war production stops and all these soldiers come back home and there won't be jobs for them. Uh, 1919 and 1920, right in the middle of a pandemic too, were terrible years in America. Not as bad as Western Europe was going through, but it was bad. And uh, so there was a history for the US government to deal with what's gonna happen when a massive war comes to an end. They did a better job of it. You already mentioned the GI Bill. Um, they continued keeping rationing in place to try to keep wages and prices under control. And uh, what they found out was that instead of a bust, when people came back from the war, there was a boom, including a baby boom. And uh, the biggest problem that happened in 1946 and 47, by the way, I'm, I'm in 1946 right now, I'm reading my Saturday evening post from 46. And one of the things you'll notice is there's a, a lot of ads for new stuff that's coming online. The number one thing they're having trouble with is not enough steel. Uh, to make the fridges and the cars and everything that everybody wanted. So uh, the economy came out of the war uh, in the, when by 1946-47, rationing's gone, wages and prices are going up, and in some cases up dramatically. Uh, so there was a fair amount of inflation then. The British lived with rationing until the 50s. Wow. And then um, somebody wants to know, how about the Rick Atkinson World War II trilogy? Do you oh, have yeah, any that's, on that? you know, there, that is just, a, that's the, that was the one, if you want to read about it, the American army in Western Europe, that's, go to those three books. Okay. Uh, they're fantastic. They'll make you cry in some cases. Uh, in the Pacific War, if you're interested, there's an author named Ian Toll, spelled just like it sounds, T-O-L-L. -L. He's written a trilogy of the Pacific War. So he's kind of complimenting Atkinson. So if you're interested in the, if, you, if your family's history is the Pacific Front and uh, Okinawa, Iwo Jima, Guadalcanal, these are names that are really important in your family, read Ian Toll. Uh, he's got a, a similar trilogy, very well written. Excellent. We'll pass these on to everybody. Um, and if you don't get them for some reason, again, call the Historical Society. Um, Sandra says, thank you for a great lecture. 
I was born in 1936 in Flint. I have vivid memories of what that meant to be, what that meant to be a young person. And Kathy thanks you for your lovely lecture and she wants to see your reading list. And then Janice has a question. Have okay. you heard of the 5220 bill that I am told helped local men get skills such as carpentry or farming? 52 oh, no. weeks of post sixth grade education plus training in practical trades and a $20 a week supplement. I have not heard of that. That's fantastic. If, uh, where did she, where did she know of this? Is she got familiar, if she's personally familiar with it or did she, did she look it up? Well, we'll wait to hear from back from Janice. Can I answer that? Yes, please. Yes. Um, I'm from Bear Lake, Michigan, which isn't too far away. And I interviewed Rob Iverson, who lives on Norconk Road in Bear Lake. And he is a World War II veteran. And I asked him about skills when men came home because lots of them left with a fifth grade education and right. he became a carpenter and he said you had to have a sponsor and his dad was a carpenter so he sponsored him to go to Manistee High School uh, I think one or two nights a week for about four hours and that education was kind of to bring these men up on mathematical skills particularly such as trying to figure out square footage for a house or how much lumber right. you needed or whatever or carpentry. And if you stuck with the program for 52 weeks, you got $20 a week. And then when you graduated, they gave you the tools that you needed for that trade. And he was a carpenter and he was a carpenter all his life in Bear Lake, Michigan. And he's a wonderful man to talk to if you ever wanna interview a fascinating World War II vet. I just Google him and call him and he loves to talk. That's fantastic. I, that's the first I've heard of that one. That's where I look. I love doing these lectures. I'm going to, I learn as much as I instruct, I think, in most days when I'm teaching. That's great. Janice, if you wouldn't mind, I'd love to get a phone call from you with more information about this veteran because we do do oral histories here. And it okay, sounds like I'll call you tomorrow. That'd be wonderful. I'll be here by nine, probably by 8 30. Okay. Thank you. And any other questions before we let Brian go? I love that everyone is asking questions. It shows that this is a very engaging topic. Um, I know there's more stories to tell about World War II and Brian is also very well, um, a, a World War I historian as well. Um, so if you would like to see more presentations on that, let us know. And if there's certain aspects of those wars or any other, um, you know, battles that we've had, wars, and, um, you know, let us know. Oh, Mary Leak has a question. Right. She asked about the difference between logistics and tactics. Thank Good you. question. <laughs> yeah, I, I learned that quote from a very, very wise man. Uh, some of you may know of him. He was, uh, along with his wife, the, uh, they ran the International Affairs Forum for years, Jack Siegel. And uh, Jack and I have been friends for a while. He was our ambassador to NATO. Uh, he lives here in Traverse City. Uh, but he started his career as a young officer in the U.S. Army during the Vietnam War. Uh, after the war was over, I believe he went to Vietnam and interviewed some of the men he fought against. He is a very interesting person. And one of the things that we when we were starting to talk about dealing with, uh, we did a small TV series on local television about World War I. And uh, that was one of the first things that we talked about is this, how wars get won in most cases is who brings the most stuff <laughs> at the right place at the right time. And how it's used in some cases might not matter as long as there's a lot of it. And uh, that's basically how the United States through its incredible latent industrial power of the 19... Remember, in the 1930s, the Depression had idled so much of America. Uh, the market for industrial products was you know, next to nothing for in 1932. So the know-how of how to take iron from Minnesota and Michigan and turn it into tanks 
and how to get bauxite from the Caribbean and turn it into aluminum and then the airplanes, how to get oil out of the ground out of Arizona and turn it or uh, in Texas and turn it into aviation fuel. And more importantly, how to take a bunch of farm boys and factory workers and turn them into soldiers. That that's logistical power and uh, organizational power and logistical power. Um, American tank uh, crews, uh, they had kind of a really tough job. They knew when they went up against the Germans that the Germans, in effect, were driving tanks that were the equivalent of a S-class Mercedes. And they were driving something that might be a little closer to a broken down Buick Century from about 1985. <laughs> Ran okay, but uh, the armor is not thick enough. The gun wasn't strong enough but they made so many of them and u.s tank battalions would lose half their strength in a fight with the germans if the crews were still alive if they were able to bail out of the tanks before they got burned to death and ran away if they got back to their operating base the next day there'd be another 20 brand new sherman tanks oh. this happened over and over during the war um and the Germans literally couldn't, could never do that. They had built their tanks to a standard of quality that did, could not be replicated on the scale that the United States was doing. When it came to airplanes, um, the same thing applied, except the quality difference between American airplanes and everybody else's there was nil. And in fact, in most cases, American planes were far superior. It's only at the very end of the war when the Germans start using jet planes and believe it or not, and they even had a rocket plane. I mean, you talk about crazy. They had a plane where a guy got in and it's a rocket engine. It's not a jet. They would shoot him up in the air at about 700 miles an hour. He'd get about 40,000 feet up and then he would come down. And when the rocket fuel came out, I guess the goal was that you would land and, and be alive. <laughs> um, but their regular jet fighters that they flew. Uh, do you imagine the shock on the, American B-17 bomber pilot crews when a jet flies by you. They'd heard of jet planes. They'd never seen them before. The Germans built them. Um, but they couldn't build enough of them. And if you took, uh, have any of you, do you any of you know what the largest enclosed space in the world was in 1945? It's the Willow Run Bomber Factory in Ypsilanti, wow. Michigan. That was the largest enclosed space in the world. And at the end of the war, they're cranking out B-24s one a minute. Every minute, a new completed plane is coming out of there. They built an airfield next to it, and they take off from there. Uh, so our ability to pile up the supplies, and yes, it helps if you know what to do with them, but to have the weapons of war, the ammunition, the food, you know, I have I, maybe some of you are from families that can't touch a can of spam. I always keep one in my office just in case. <laughs> they asked Stalin once, you know, that terrible, horrible human that ran the Soviet Union. He said, what's the best thing that ever came out of America? This stuff. We <laughs> sent this over to the Russians in shiploads of it. Just nothing but spam filled to the to the to the to the decks and Studebaker trucks. We had so much stuff, we were giving it away to everybody. Uh, Russian pilots flew American planes, gladly. And half the trucks in the Red Army were made in America. So that's the logistical story. Brian, my mother made Spam burgers for every teenage party that we had. <laughs> I, I still eat it, you know, my kids <laughs> like I taught my kids to like it. I say you're tasting the taste of victory right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any other any, questions for me, Barb? I don't see any. I'm going to look through them real quick to see if I overlooked any. Uh, any compliments? Before I, before I let you guys go, um, this is one of the books I used for um, this lecture. And it's called Christmas Under Fire, 1944. It's written by a Dutch historian. It's not very big. Um, and it's mainly about how Christmas is celebrated uh, across the world that night, but with a lot of other vignettes about, 
you know, like a lot about truces where the Germans and the Americans would meet each other and stop shooting. Um, he's a Dutch author, so there's quite a bit about uh, life in occupied Holland during this time, which was horrible. The Germans shut off the electricity for December. They said that the Dutch didn't need it. Um, people, the, the half of Holland was still under Nazi control in December of 44. And uh, if you ever want to meet people who are grateful for Americans, meet the Dutch, especially of the generation of the World War II generation. Uh, they have a very special place in their hearts for us. So that's a really cool kind of finishing touch. I will put together a reading list of what I think are the best World War II books for you folks. And you can find them on the website. We'll have it ready for you probably sometime before the weekend. And then if somebody, um, if folks don't go onto the website and you would like me to email it to you, email info at benzemuseum.org and then I can mail you the list if you prefer it that way. But Brian's has been fantastic. Um, we definitely want to have you back. I, I could hear more about this topic. Um, and and it, it is a never ending well of interesting things. Like I said, that, that author I mentioned earlier, Anthony Bevor, he has written things. Uh, you know, when you read about World War II a lot and I teach it, they, man, I think I, I probably have heard it all. <laughs> Not even close. And uh, like I said, he'll, he's written stuff that when I read it the first time, I just, I just stop. And uh, does that, is that real? Did that really happen? There's so much about this story from this period. Um, and uh, if you just did the home front, like I was trying to emphasize in this lecture, uh, we're, we were a different people at the end of this experience. These four years changed the world and America in ways that we're still trying to get our heads around in some respects. Thank you so much, people. Appreciate you. you. Uh, and uh, don't forget your museum. Yes, remember we have a three to one fundraising challenge going on right now. So for every $50 you give, somebody else will give 150 for a total of 200 and you can give more. We accept larger donations as well. So thank you so much. Wonderful to see you all and we'll see you in January. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. Thank you.